So let's take another look at the white box challenge of RHME3. Last week I already explained to you kind of where the solution is going. It's about white box cryptography and it's an AES implementation. And that means that AES is in there, but in a weird encoded way. But I also didn't know this at the beginning. And so I started to show you how I approach this challenge by just starting to reverse engineer how the program is working. And we noticed this very weird calling convention kind of, where there are not really that many subroutines, but there is like a f array of function pointers. And based on that, the program then jumps around. At the end of last video, I also showed to you that Binary Ninja is a bit smarter and it can realize that jump RAX is a jump table and it can show us all the different cases where it might jump to. We also had a quick look at what kind of these functions are implementing but we really haven't fully understood now the program. And so this is the next step that I took. I wanted to understand how the program is flowing and if or how input is affecting the flow of the program. Because like I said, I didn't know at this point that it is AES. Basically, I wanted to start to trace the program execution. And I want to do this with GDB. Basically, I want to set a breakpoint at this address here and record all the RAX there where it wants to jump to. To do this, just copy the address of the jump RAX. To implement the tracing, I'm using a GDB init file. A GDB init file instructs GDB to perform certain commands when GDB is started. So in this case, I specify that I want to set a breakpoint at the address of the jump RAX. And then I can specify some commands that will be executed when this breakpoint is hit. So we say it's silent, so this prevents GDB from outputting some other information. And then we create a printf with the address of RAX. So this is where we would jump to next. And then we continue so the program doesn't pause at all. So we can save this now and then execute this with GDB. We can specify GDB minus X and then the GDB init file and then just the binary we want to debug. Okay, so as you can see, the GDB in it worked because you can see here that the, there's a breakpoint set at this address of the jump RAX. And when we now execute it, we should be able to see all the functions that are being executed. So there are some errors that have to do with uh, pwn debug, but ignore that below here. The interesting part is above here. Those are the addresses that were printed by our GDB init file. We can also see that we didn't properly invoke the white box binary with the 16 bytes of plain text. So we exited again, telling us how the binary should be used. This means these three addresses don't really have anything to do with the algorithm itself. But let's investigate what they are for. So we can copy them and just look them up in binary ninja. You can press G and then enter the address where you want to go. Okay, so this is just doing basically nothing. So now to not forget what we will look up, it's good to write this somehow down. And I decide to write this into a Python structure because I already have in mind that I might want to kind of like parse this and look at this and comment automatically the workflow. You will see later what I mean. But so I specify now a simple Python dictionary with the address and the comment to it, what, what it is doing. So let's continue with the next address. G, enter the address, look it up. So here's a compare. It's comparing another local variable with two, and then it either executes, follows the one path or the other path. And the last address here has two printers. So it's very likely that it actually prints the usage output that we just saw. This function is also a little bit different because it actually calls three other functions, but they are all the same. So maybe it would be interesting to look in what these functions are doing. It's fair to assume that these functions take two parameters, ESI and EDI. Let's see, this address here appears twice. So it's loaded into EDI of printf. So it's pretty clear that this is the string that is being printed by printf. And so this address is also loaded for this function here. And if you look at the other three functions, here EDI is one and here EDI is two. So the address changes here that is loaded into printf and also this number here. 
before you even click and look into what this function is doing, it's pretty obvious that this is somehow setting up the string that is being printed by printf. And edi is used as kind of an index into a table with all the strings, I assume. So let's investigate. Okay, so this is also a pretty big function. And to be honest with you, I was pretty lazy when I saw this and thought, uh, I don't want to really look into this right now. But I assumed it's probably kind of like a get string function where the first parameter specifies the index of the string or the number of the string. And the second parameter is a buffer where the string should be loaded to. It's a CTF, I want to be lazy, and it's kind of obvious that it, this is what it's doing. I can't imagine it to do anything else. I would maybe get back to it if something would really confuse me and maybe I didn't understand this. But it always appears around the printf, so it's pretty fair to assume that this is what it does. So let's write this down as well. So what we have is the first function doesn't matter, and then we compare something if it is 2. And apparently this was not the case because we print then this one message here. And so it's fair to assume that this might actually be arc C, that you compare if you entered one command line parameter. We can kind of try this. Let's run this, but this time with 16 bytes input. I suspect that now as a third function, we would see something else. Oh, wow, a lot of more stuff even happened. And if we compare now the third function, it is indeed something else. Okay, so let's continue our path and check out what EA is. Okay, so now it checks an strlen and a string compare. So maybe it is time to look into what get string returns. So we can copy both these addresses and set breakpoints specifically for those in GDB. And then we run it and we hit the breakpoint. So we are going to call strlen and it calls strlen on stdin. So strlen will return the length of stdin, and that's clearly one of the command line parameters that are possible to be used here. And if we see where the re return is going to, it's being used as one of the parameters for strn compare. So it's not just a string compare, it's an strn compare, so it requires also the length, how many characters you want to compare. And so if we continue once to the string compare, we can see that the parameter that we entered, the AAA, is compared to STDIN with the length of 7. This is what was returned from the STRLN. So all this function is doing, it checks if you use the STDIN functionality or if you use a regular 16-byte input. And so again, we can describe what this function is doing. It's just checking the arguments that you passed in. And this is basically all I was doing next. So while this is a very tedious task, I did get a bit bored and just wanted to explore a little bit further, especially I was very curious about these repeating calls. So let's check out one of the repeating calls. So this performs a compare if one variable is f and then either executes this one case or the other case. And f is 16, so let's count really quick how often this function is called. It's called 17 times which matches with the check for 16. So this looks like there's kind of a for loop that is counting upwards and every loop iteration is checking if it's reached and if it's reached, it's done. Very interesting, okay. So we can write this down as a check that is checking if i is larger than hex f. So let's have a look at the other function, a55. Hmm. It calls get string and then also has a printf. That is indeed pretty weird. So maybe let's set a breakpoint at this address and see what's happening here. So here's the printf and the first parameter is a format string O2x and then as a first parameter it inputs 35. So this loop is just slowly outputting the result. So all these functions here are just there to print the result. So somehow our interesting stuff must be in here. So these three functions are still unclear to us what they are doing. Probably at this time I had a uh, feeling, oh, I'm really, really close or something like that. I couldn't be further from the truth. Okay, so this one function is also another compare. It, okay, but pretty un uninteresting. Let's check the next one. Here's a string copy. We could also quickly set a breakpoint here and investigate what the string copy is doing. So here's the string copy. It just copies our input AAA to another buffer. Okay, so only one function left. 
That looks like that must be the holy grail, I guess. Oh, there's a call to another function. And if we look into this function, we are presented with another jump table, another jump RAX. And look at this. There's even one function that is just super, super long. I really don't want to have to reverse engineer this. But there are also a few shorter ones, like all the way over there or over there. But I guess we are not done with the tracing. So I guess we need to set another breakpoint here and trace these functions as well. So we have to extend our GDB init script with this address as well. We saved this. So you can see now that both breakpoints are loaded. And now let's run the binary again. And you see how all the functions are being traced now. Oh yeah, there's so much more happening. Let's actually copy this now into our Python script. So I call this now GDB output. And then we can write a few lines to just parse this. We uh, go through each line of this output. We extract the address as an integer. And then we check if we have added comments in our block dictionary. And so then we print this line with the comment or just type unknown. And then the output looks pretty good already. We can see all the functions that are being called. And we can see all the comments that we have made about some of those functions. And then you can just start continuing like figuring out all these unnamed functions and see what they are doing. And this is a pretty tedious part. And I'm lazy, right? So you can obviously go through just address by address, or you can also just look at the functions themselves, which are the easy functions. Let me get started with these. That also kind of makes sense because, you know, maybe these very easy functions that are easy to reverse engineer and see what they are doing, they maybe help you already with a more rough understanding. And after a while, you get a very verbose trace already. So you can see here how, for example, byte by byte, 16 bytes are being copied into another buffer. And then we have some kind of loops here that are checking. And there are still some unknown functions in here as well. And while looking through some of these functions, I found another call here, which looking at it does also some weird stuff, but it's not that long. So I kind of thought, hmm, if we look at one of these weird functions, why not start with this one? This one looks easy. But I also was pretty lazy. So instead of going through line by line here, trying to understand this assembly code, we can also just try to debug this. You can set a breakpoint before and after this function and see what is happening. Okay, first breakpoint is hit. We can still see that our input string is still perfectly fine. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And when we continue once, we can see here now that RDE completely changed. It is now 05AF49, so it's very different. And on first sight, it doesn't really tell you much. It looks like very just randomly thrown together and very weird. But let's do it again with a slightly different value. Let's look at this. So while with the first example, it was not quite clear that it was still our input, with the second example, it's pretty clear. So when I first saw this, I thought, oh, this is amazing. This is just scrambling a little bit the input. And I thought I was so clever thinking that we could now modify the binary and knob out this function because that probably makes the analysis that we kind of have to do easier. So I create this binary that has this scrambling function removed and executed and the output still looks similar so it still works. But when I then change just the last byte, I noticed that only like a few single bytes in there changed and I thought, oh my gosh, I am onto something. Now we can do all this analysis. Maybe this corresponds to four bytes and with XOR and I don't know yet, but we will analyze it. We collect a lot of data and just like see correlations and see what it's doing. I mean, I was a com going down a completely wrong path. This was complete bullshit what I did, but I felt like, oh my gosh, I'm really close. But one other thought has been bugging me. Remember, at this point in time, I still didn't know for a fact that it is AES. The description of the challenge wrote that it's about crypto and you have to extract the key. But I was looking at the trace and those functions that are implemented and I was thinking, this does not look like encryption. This is clearly not encryption. For encryption, you need some kind of key that is variable and it does something with the key. But this looks like a hash function. There's no key involved. 
you give it some input and it scrambles it around in a crazy way and you get some output. So I was sitting there and just getting really frustrated, thinking, this is so dumb. Why would somebody call this encryption? Don't call this encryption. This is a hash function. I was kind of getting mad about this because sometimes you read like online tutorials of just people that are not that deep into technology yet and call base64 encryption. And I thought, no, rescue is not dumb. They wouldn't call a hash function encryption or decryption. They wouldn't do this. But this doesn't still doesn't make any sense what is going on. And even though looking at this function that is scrambling stuff, even though this was not the right path, it did plant a small seed in the back of my head. Also at the same time I was following conversations on IRC and obviously people constantly leak information about a challenge. And I kept seeing them talking about AAS. So even though some people talked about this AAS, Looking at this, looking at what I see in the code and reverse engineering it, I was not convinced. I was pretty confident that this is not AES, but this little seed was still like in the back of my head. And now this AES seed in my head and the function that I just knocked out that looked so interesting and weird in some way kind of tickled my brain and I gave AES another chance. So I was looking again at the AES encryption and I was still like convinced that it's not AES. For example, like I mentioned in the first video, there is the add round key step which would perform an XOR and you can actually search the whole binary for the occurrences of XOR, which I also did at some point to find this add round key step, but it doesn't show up. It, it's just not implemented like this. But so I was still convinced it's not AES. But also while looking at these pictures and reading how all these single steps in AES work, I did see that Wikipedia always displays it as this kind of blocks of 4x4. I thought maybe I should also visualize my data that I have 4x4. And so I started to take notes. So these are my original notes from when I was playing the challenge. And obviously there's a lot more stuff on here already, but it all started with what I wrote in the top corner here. So as you can see, I also used an input that was recognizable, but then ordered this input in form of a 4x4 matrix like I saw it on Wikipedia. And you can see instead of intuitively writing 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 as the rows, I wrote them as the columns because that is also how it is shown on Wikipedia. And then I performed the function that we knobbed out just before that it's doing this weird mixing stuff and wrote it down in the same way. And this is the result. And when you look closely, you can see that the first row stays the same and the second one is actually shifted, is moved or rotated by one. And then the third row is rotated by three. And then having the AES algorithm in the back of my head, I realized, holy crap, this is the AES step shift rows. And this was proof for me enough. What I'm looking at is AES. I don't remember the exact timeline of the events when I was playing, but around the same time, probably on this at the same day, a friend also told me about white box cryptography, that that is actually a thing. It was kind of a small hint because I got really frustrated. That is first when I learned about that white box cryptography exists. But we continue with this next video. But what we did in this video, and which was a very important step is, we reverse engineered the binary far enough to find proof that what it is implemented here is actually AAS.